everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity to present today. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for you to learn more about marine science and also to give you an understanding of the sorts of jobs that are out there if you do pursue a, de a degree or a, um, a career in marine science. So my love of marine science started back when I was about six. Uh, I was going for a swim with my dad and he gave me some goggles for the first time. And prior to then, every time I got in the water, all the seaweed was big black things that wanted to eat me. And when I put the goggles on, suddenly I could see fish and kelp and bubbles and I was just transfixed. So that was the start of my love. And I then undertook a career in marine science, but it's not any direct sort of route. It's quite a meandering route when you have a career, I find. And you'll probably find that with your careers also. I did a Bachelor of Science and it graduated in 1994. So back then there was no marine science at uni, but I did do zoology and botany. So they were sort of the big foundations. And finished my um, honours degree and worked for a consultancy for a couple of years. And in that role, I basically did anything and everything they wanted me to do because it was my first job out of uni and I was so excited to have a job. But like many young people, I really wanted to travel. So in 1999 and 2000, for about a year and a half, I lived on a yacht off um, and sailed off the coast of Madagascar. So that was just a really transformative life experience. And I really encourage all young people not only to pursue higher degrees, but also to do travel because it just broadens your lens on the world and on yourself. I returned from traveling overseas and I got a great job at Department of Fisheries. Um, one of my key roles was looking at um, habitats at the Brolis Islands and potential impacts of various activities out there like rock lobster potting, boat anchoring, uh, trawling, um, all those sorts of potential physical impacts. And my other role was working on, well, I was at fisheries, working on crayfishing boats, getting up at two in the morning, going out in any old crayfishing boat, commercial fishing boat that would accept me and measuring every single thing that came up in their pots. And that was to feed into the stock assessment. And that was just a great experience to work with commercial fishermen, to see all those coastal towns. But for me, after a couple of years, I really needed something a bit more mentally challenging because I was really just a data collector and I wasn't writing the reports. So I went back and did a PhD at the age of 30, um, which is, you know, getting on a bit and just really wanted to pursue the higher degree, the higher thinking and expand my expertise. So I did my PhD on the Ningaloo Reef, which is an amazing place. And I studied coral reef ecology. And when I was there, I lived in Exmouth and I studied and did my research in Coral Bay. And that was just a wonderful period in my life. I definitely worked really, really hard, but it was really, really fun. So working hard doesn't have necessarily have to be exclusive to fun. It was really rewarding and yeah, really enjoyed it. When I finished that job, I or that my PhD, I then went on to work back in the consulting world again. And this time I was working in dredge monitoring on coral uh, monitoring programs. So these dredging vessels, as you can see here, create a massive plume when they're undertaking their operations. And that's the, the image to your left is Barrow Island. In that big white plume you can see there is a dredge plume and all around that area are coral reefs. So we did a whole pile of baseline studies to understand the reefs, their diversity, their growth rates, the mapping. And then when the dredging was underway, we had an intensive monitoring program. And that's me in a, I had to get a commercial diving license. That took me two months to get it. And that whole get up used to weigh about 12 kilos when I was wearing it. But that was a wonderful experience as well. I would live on boats for two weeks at a time and dive every single day doing coral monitoring. That work finished, and like a lot of consultancy work does, and 
then I went on to work at AusAid. And that was as an international volunteer. And when you think volunteer, you think you're not getting paid. We actually got paid the equivalent of a middle management salary, which is about $15,000 a year, which in Tonga was enough to rent a house, have a car, be able to go out for dinner and travel a little bit. So, you know, it was, it was a decent salary. And I've always wanted to work in, in a developing country, in marine conservation. And that that desire sort of was from way back when I did my sailing trip. And so this AusAid International Volunteer experience is available to young people. And I really encourage um, people to have a look at that because it's just a wonderful way to go to another country and immerse yourself in culture. Finished that job and then came back to Australia and worked in uh, seafood sustainability, which is basically you look at um, the assessment of the stock, the fish stocks, you look at the environmental impacts and how the fishery is managed. And then if it's considered to be sustainable, it is certified. So um, I don't know if you can see my image, but you know, things like your tins of tuna, you look for the little blue logo. This is for the Marine Stewardship Council. That was um, the outcome of that work. So you look, you certify fisheries and you know that they're not over exploiting the fish stocks. And finally, to where I am now, uh, Department of Water and Environmental Regulation. I've been there since 2018. And one of my key roles is advising the Environmental Protection Authority on marine proposals. So anything in the marine environment, if they want to build a port, a marina, an aquaculture development, if they want to build salt farms, have desalinisation plants, oil and gas, renewable energy as well. All of these proposals are in the marine environment and we assess those impacts and then advise the EPA on whether or not it's an acceptable impact. So that's me. Um, and now I'll move on to the main part of my talk, which is talking about marine pollutants. And it's a bit of a you know, not super exciting subjects. So I thought I'd give you a case study down in Coburn Sound. So Coburn Sound, if you don't know, is um, it's south of Fremantle and it's but it's between the top of Garden Island all the way down to Rockingham. So it's a really large embayment. It's about 20 kilometres long. It is an ecologically and socially important area. It has iconic species like little penguins and bottlenose dolphins. It's regionally significant for fish stocks, for the pink snapper, and that picture there in the left bottom corner is a, a spawning aggregation, and they spawn in Coburn Sound. That's also important for King George whiting and garfish. It's a naturally um, protected embayment, and it's one of the few ones on the West Coast. And it's also a really popular area for recreational activities, for sailing, for swimming, for diving, um, and just recreating on the beach. It is also an area of industrial focus. So this is an area to the north of Coburn Sound. Um, so this is the whole of Coburn Sound, the image below, and the industrial area is sort of where the yellow is. Um, the types of industry that's there is BHP refinery, there's a power station, there's a desalinisation plant, fertiliser plants, a tannery, Alcoa, um, it's the outer port to Fremantle, and there's also a really big uh, naval base on Garden Island. And all this industrial development started in the 40s and 50s, and um, it was deliberately a focal area for industrial development because of those protected areas, and they wanted to put all the industry in one location. Those industries come with some forms of pollutants or poll of discharges. So into Coburn Sound, there are several sources of pollution at the moment. Um, this is a little infographic showing all sources of pollution. Coburn Sound doesn't have all of these. But the key ones that are coming into Coburn Sound are industrial discharge either directly into the sound through um, pipe discharge pipes or indirectly through groundwater contamination, which then later reaches the sound. Um, there's uh, 
discharges coming from residential areas, either from septic tanks or from sewerage, or there was. There are stormwater drains which drain from residential and industrial areas. And there's also agriculture in the hinterland or in the surrounding areas of Coben Sound, which has used a lot of fertiliser and has livestock, which ends up in the groundwater and then ultimately discharging to Coben Sound. This is an actual photograph of discharges from the BP refinery, and I think it's in the 1970s. So in the 1960s to 1980s, there was basically unabated pollution. It was unrestricted. Industry discharged directly to the sound, um, and the sorts of discharges contained heavy metals and nutrients. And there was also tributal tin found in Coben Sound, which is a anti-foulant. It was particularly found around jetties. And it's an anti-foulant they used to use on vessels, and it's known to have toxic effects, and it was found to cause um, imposects in the snails or gastropods, which means they all turn into males. And that seems really outrageous. There was this, you know, unrestricted pollution to the sound in the nine between 1960s and 80s. But the Environmental Protection Act only came into place in 1986. So prior to that. There was really no mechanism to control and manage what was going on. So those huge nutrient loads I was talking about, which are one of the key discharges to Coben Sound, had severe consequences to the ecosystem. Nutrients are known to cause phytoplankton blooms because the, the phytoplankton can take the nutrients up and multiply really quickly. It also stimulated epiphytic algal growth on seagrass. So as you can see, it's really thick on the seagrass blades. Both of these mechanisms resulted in reduced light to seagrass and extensive seagrass loss in Coburn Sound. It's estimated that around 80% of seagrass was lost in the sound. So the image to the left, I think, is from the 1970s. Um, this is, that's the Coben Sound, and you can see Garden Island to the left. The dark green's the seagrass. And then when you come over to 2017, you can see that's all sand. So it's estimated that around 80% of seagrass is lost, or 23 square kilometres, which is the distance from Fremantle to the back of Rocknest. That's about 23 kilometres. And then add a kilometre wide to that. So that's a massive area of seagrass loss. And why is that important? Well, seagrass have really important roles in the ecosystem. They stabilise the sea, seabed and provide coastal protection. Seagrass forms a habitat for fish and invertebrates, and it's especially important as a nursery. It's important for blue carbon sequestration. It locks carbon into the sediments. It oxygenates the water. And yeah, it's just an important all round role to, the, to an ecosystem. Now, we go. Understandably, there was public concerns and media outrage about the state of Coben Sound. There was concerns about impacts to seagrass, worries about how it may be affecting aquaculture. There were concerns that people couldn't swim, they couldn't fish, um, and yeah, it was just not in a good state and the community were very concerned. And the government stepped up and had implemented some environmental regulations. So this was always a long term coming, long time coming, but it just, you know, this was this was all back in the 80s when environmental regulation was sort of new. Um, and there was a strong opposition from industry and so it involved a coerced a co coordinated effort between community and government and industry. So one of the first things they did is this yellow line you can see at the back is a wastewater discharge pipeline. So all of industry were no longer allowed to discharge directly into Coburn Sound. They had to discharge instead into this wastewater discharge pipeline and they had to treat their wastewater prior to discharging into it. So there was no longer direct discharges within Coburn Sound. And this pipeline discharges 
off the back of Point Perrin into about 20 metres depth of water. And yes, there are still discharges occurring to the marine environment, but this area is, has a lot greater water movement. It's got more currents and it's deeper and the water has been treated prior to reaching this discharge point. Another government initiative that uh, for the management of Coburn Sound was getting the Coburn Sound Management Council, forming that council. And on that were representatives from government, from community, from conservation groups, from industry, from commercial fishers, so that there was one management body that was responsible for the regulation and monitoring of Coban Sound so that, that they could collectively be in one place to manage the sound. And importantly, there was the state environment policy. So they introduced a policy to protect the sound. And the key roles of that policy were to stop pollution, to improve the state of the environment, and to create a multi-user framework for the sound so that industry, rec users, commercial fishers, they can all still use the sound, but in a more harmonious manner. So one of the first things that state environment policy sets out to do is identify what are the values you want to protect in the sound. So one of the first and obvious values is ecosystem health to maintain it. Second is fishing and aquaculture, recreation and aesthetics, cultural values and spiritual values, indigenous values, and industrial water supply. And that latter one might seem a bit strange, but industry wants to be assured that they can extract seawater that's of high quality so that they can undertake their industrial um, operations, such as the desal plant extracts water from Coburn Sound and then desalinates it and provide, provides water to this drinking supply to Perth. Each of these environmental values, which are identified in the state environment policy, has an objective. So you can say, oh, we want to protect ecosystem health or we want to protect fishing. What is it actually that you want to object? What are the objectives for that? So for ecosystem health, it's to protect the integrity of the ecosystem. For fishing, it's to have fish safe to eat. For recreation, it's to have waters that are safe to swim and boat in. Um, so objectives are really important part of these environmental values. Another um, thing that the state environment policy set out was spatial areas of protection with a low, moderate and high areas of ecological protection. So the blue is a high area of ecological protection. The green is moderate ecological protection and the dark areas are low ecological protection. And basically what this is, is a spatial representation of where certain standards are required to be achieved. So in high ecological protection, there can be no impacts to water quality and no impacts to ecosystem function. In the moderate ecological protection area, which is the area adjacent to industry, but not where all the recreational areas are focused, there can be some changes to water quality, but this cannot have an impact to the ecosystem or to fishing or to um, recreational activities. And finally, in the low ecological protection area, which is really small, this area can have reductions in water and sediment quality, but it can only be restricted to this particular area, and then it has to achieve the moderate areas beyond that small area. So it's one thing to have this state environment policy and to have a management council. How do you know if you're achieving it? So the next um, thing that the uh, state environment policy set up to do was have a monitoring program. So these are all the monitoring sites in Coburn Sound. And with that monitoring, you can monitor the condition of the sound, then report on it on a regular basis, and then it will identify the status of the sound. And if things aren't tracking in the right direction, then management can be implemented.
but what do you monitor? And it needs to be relevant. You know, you can monitor a whole range of things, but it really needs to be directed in management. And typically, um, monitoring programs focus on the pressure response model, where the pressure is a pressure on the environment, such as nutrient enrichment, and the response is the response of the environment, such as phytoplankton growth, epiphytic growth on, on seagrass, and then a reduction in seagrass health. So this pressure response here, you can see on the left-hand side where you've got a natural nutrient load. That below that, the phytoplankton concentrations are at their natural levels. There's natural light and the seagrass are in good condition. When that pressure increases as you move to your right, so now it's a high pressure, you have high nutrient loads, high phytoplankton abundance, reduced light and causing seagrass loss. So you're going to undertake monitoring, you're going to use a pressure response model, and then you need to decide what environment, which, which indicators you're going to use. What are your environmental indicators? So for Cobain Sound, the monitoring program looks at toxicants in water, metals, hydrocarbons and pesticides. These are all pressures. Our nutrient concentrations can be looked at, but often they just focus on phytoplankton abundance because nutrient concentrations can be really dynamic. Light levels seagrass health and dissolved oxygen levels. So you set up your monitoring program, you've got your monitoring sites, you've got your values, you've got your indicators, you're going out and doing the monitoring, what are the acceptable levels of change? That's another consideration in monitoring programs. So for toxicants, for things like your heavy metals, they are internationally established um, limits of acceptable change and that's established by we currently use the Australian New Zealand guidelines. For other parameters there are no international guidelines so you look at your reference sites so that down in just south of Coben Sound there's Warmbra Sound and that's where the reference sites is, reference sites are and you compare the baseline data or the ongoing data you have from your reference sites to your monitoring sites within Coburn Sound and see if there's any difference between the two. And if Coburn Sound's found to be tracking in a downward direction, whereas Coowoomba Sound's either travelling stable or improving, then you definitely know something is not right. All of this monitoring is reported annually to the Minister for the Environment and published in a report every three years. And this reporting framework ensures that the health of Coben Sound is reviewed annually and that management can be implemented if needed. So how is the sound tracking? This is a graph of water quality in one of the high protection areas in the north of the sound. The x-axis starts in 1975 and goes up to 2000, I can't quite tell, probably about 19. And this is the water quality index where a red F is obviously not doing well and an A or B is much better condition. So as you can see that the state of the sound for water quality, this site has improved through time. So that's great. And most of Coburn Sound has good water quality now. However, the seagrass isn't recovering as quickly and we're not sure why but it could be related to the high organic loads which remain in the sediment. So a lot of that seagrass loss would have resulted in a lot of detritus and then an organic load in, in Coburn Sound, and that may be the reason that the seagrass isn't recovering. Either the organic load doesn't, it provides a substrate that's not suitable, or it could result in reduced light quality when it gets resuspended. There's also groundwater contamination. The plumes are moving towards the coast. Um, so there's that history or that legacy of groundwater contamination. And some of the fish stocks are still depressed. Um, garfish and blue sumo crabs in particular. And there's some new challenges for Coburn Sound too. Uh, climate change is a challenge, you know, is a a challenge for all environments and seagrass in particular is vulnerable to heat waves 
Um, in Shark Bay, there was a heat wave a couple of years ago, which had decimated the seagrass in that area. That hasn't happened at Coburn Sound, but could. There's a new proposed port for the area for Quinana. There's more additional industrial development, and it's not all bad. You know, there's the the, the green hydrogen initiative wants to come in. So you know, there's there's new environmentally positive industries that want to develop in Coburn Sound. And there's also this challenge of emerging contaminants that, which could be discharged or somehow rather enter the sound. Things like PFAS, that firefighting foam, which has recently been in the media a lot and found to be uh, carcinogenic to humans. Um, microplastics is another one. So whilst there's these challenges, there's also innovative solutions. And that's where I see the future for the new marine biologists of this world, like yourselves. Um, there's an amazing program at the moment with seagrass rehabilitation that's being undertaken, and it's called Seeds for Snapper. And rather than what they've worked out is a lot of um, seagrass seeds wash up on the shore. They're like green at about two to three centimetres long every season during the, the um, flowering season and then just die. So they've been collecting those en masse and putting them in sacks and then putting them back down into the marine environment and having really good success with initiating some rehabilitation of seagrass. There's also, you know, another really dynamic and new area is investigating heat tolerant seagrass species. So finding out the physiological and molecular um, capacities or characteristics of this seagrass, which makes it heat tolerant. And then can they transplant some seagrass from northern areas down to Sharp, down to um, Coban Sound, so that they can bring in these more heat tolerant individuals. Port design, you know, working better with nature rather than against it, and having living walls on the on the breakwaters, and making sure that it doesn't interrupt the, the natural flows of Quinana and Coban Sound. There's research coming into new and emerging contaminants all the time, identifying what they are. Firstly, what are the new emerging contaminants? How do you identify them? What are the, the standards or levels that can't be exceeded for those contaminants? And there's also some uh, fish stock replenishment programs going on in the sound. So that's about it. Um, the marine environment is beautiful and amazing, and we can all work together to protect it as individuals, as community, as you know, industry users of this amazing place. And my advice to future marine scientists or people interested is be curious, be bold and have fun. Thank you. Oh, you now. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, thank you so much Fiona. That's all right. Good. Um, I'll put it to the students, see if they have any questions, even though yep. some of those questions you might've already answered. So, yeah. Um, but feel free. Does anyone want to be brave? They don't have any questions they want to ask. Yeah. All right, Maddie, go. Um, because we're also looking at how you can come um, up here if you want. She'll come <laughs> up. There you can hear her. Uh, we currently also we're studying currently looking at marine pollution is a topic we're looking at, and I was we were looking at how invasive species can possibly impact when pollutants have a, affected an environment. Has there been significant impact of an invasive species in the Coburn Sound based on all the past pollution between the 1960s and 80s? That's such a good question. <laughs> um, I, off the top of my head, I don't know immediately. They do have invasive species monitoring programs throughout the state, and I am pretty sure they would have found some invasive species in the sound, but it would, they wouldn't have become really established and caused a widespread problem. But to answer your question, uh, typically when an environment is disturbed, that's when invasive species get their chance to come in because there's either a new new habitat that they can colonise or the normal ecosystem functions which would prevent those invasive species from coming in is not there, so that's when they become established. Perfect. Does anyone else have any more questions? No one wants to be right. <laughs> so in terms of um, 
just a question about pollutants in WA waters. What would be our most prominent pollutant type that we're starting to see sort of on a rise? Yeah. Um, nutrients is always, I mean, I guess a lot of the key discharges to our marine environment are from wastewater treatment plants. And when I say wastewater, it's typically our sewage. And it is treated to a certain standard, and then that wastewater is discharged further offshore. So nutrients is one of the more prevalent ones. Um, and in terms of industry, there's only a couple of industry discharge locations. And I'm just thinking further forward, um, up in the Burrup Peninsula, Definitely the role of nutrients is up there as well. So, yeah, there's a fertiliser plant that has been impacting on that area. So are we seeing a, um, uh, with any kind of impact with nutrient offload into the water, are we seeing um, any human health impacts at all? No, that's a good question. So... Any of those discharge locations are typically away from human use areas and in deeper waters and where there's high movement of either currents or waves so that as the discharge comes out, it's quickly dissipated and it is usually reaching background levels by about 70 metres. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Amazing. Um, does anyone else have any questions about pollutants in the water, impacts to ecosystems. Sure. Yep, all right. We've got one more question coming up here. <laughs> Come on up, Jess. So, so what, what class am I looking at? Is it Year 12 Science or Year 12 Marine Biology or? So we're Year 12 Marine and Maritime Studies. Oh, all right. And you just happened, weirdly, the, the way the timing worked was they were actually going to learn about types of pollutants today. So um, you've actually, you've got to do my lesson for me. <laughs> um, how does the, uh, the agriculture um, fertiliser and yeah. I wrote it down, something else. Yeah, the fertiliser and the livestock, how does that end up getting into the Coburn? Sound. Yeah, so that is a really big issue for our rivers as well. So have you ever seen those diagrams which show the catchment of a river? So, you know, it doesn't, all the water that runs to a river comes from a really large area. So, and that happens for Coburn Sound as well. The catchment, which is the big agricultural areas, is where they will have in Coburn Sound, the areas adjacent to it used to be market gardens that uh, apply a heap of fertiliser. And then that would infiltrate through the soil to the groundwater, elevate the nutrients in the groundwater, and then it's discharged to the sound. And that's a big issue, mainly for our rivers in agricultural areas where there's huge clearing and a lot of agricultural development, and you have livestock or um, cropping, which apply fertilisers, again ending up either in the groundwater or direct runoff to the river, and then that impacts on the river ecosystem because it's got a really unnaturally high nutrient load. Yeah. Question? Oh, sorry. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, do we have any more questions? Oh yeah. Okay, we've got another question. Um. With the seagrass rehabilitation, yeah. has that been, like successful? Like, um, yeah, has that been like very successful with like? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> really good question because what they've tried to do ever since they've worked out that how much seagrass was lost in Coburn Sound, they've had all these different rehabilitation programs, and they sort of work, but they're quite slow. And this Seeds for Snapper program, which is a community program if you're interested in getting involved, is only about five years old, but it seems to be having quite good success. So seagrass takes a really long time to grow and you wouldn't be able to claim it's all rehabilitated to any level at the moment, but you can say there are promising um, 
it, it looked as a promising method for rehabilitation. So they drop the sacs down and then they come back and monitor it after a year or, or two years and they're finding that seagrass has turned into small plants and is beginning to colonise the area. And, you know, a loss of 23 square kilometres takes a while to rehabilitate. So, But where they are putting those sacs of seeds down, there is certainly some rehabilitation. Are they going to have to dredge that area for Westport to be able to... They will be dredging... Well, if the proposal is to dredge an, an, an additional... Um, access point for the ships. So that will be a large source of sediments into the water column. And you can see from that picture I showed of the monitoring I was doing, and then that reduces light in the water and can impact on the seagrass. So that is one of the main pressures and issues of concern for the Westport proposal. Yeah. Do, do you all understand what the proposal is for Westport? Do you mind explaining, Fiona, to them a little yeah. bit about well, I've got a bit of a personal background to Westport, but only because my family are from, they work on the wharf down in Fremantle. Ah, okay. A little yep. bit of a bone of contention on that end, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, per, the Fremantle port um, is projected in the future to not be able to accommodate um, the shipping volume and size as in its current design. Uh, so currently it's operating at a good capacity, but in the future with the volume of ships or the number of ships and the size of them, the Fremantle port won't be able to service those ships. So they needed to look at alternatives and they considered either expanding Fremantle and doing some fancy outer port things, um, going down to Bunbury or going to Coburn Sound or just in Quinana because that's a focal industrial area. And the other issue with Fremantle is also getting trucks in and out, so the access from the land to the port. So they looked at all three of those areas and did some multi-criteria analyses and basically decided that Coburn Sound was the desired area to potentially put the new port in the future. And it's not only because it's in protective waters, but also because they can get all the roads in to link to the port. Um, so that proposal... They're currently designing it, and when they finish the design, they'll submit it to the Environmental Protection Authority for assessment. Amazing. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That might make a that might make a really good question in a waste paper. Oh. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I might come up with a question about it. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> oh they're all sad. Um, do we have any other further questions? Can they decline that offer? Um, so they're asking, do they decline the offer? For the, uh, for the port. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if it was found to have really strong environmental negative impacts on the, on Quinana area and Coburn Sound, then it would be advised that it's you know it's not considered to be a sustainable option. But there is a, a, there's been a political initiative from the premier that it's going to happen. So it's going to be an interesting space, I think. And there's a lot of the proponents are taking a lot of time to make sure they get the design to minimise the impacts. I've got a question. They're asking, do you think that it's going to have an impact on the environment? Yeah, really good question. Definitely in the dredging program. I mean, all dredging programs, you can dredging when they dig up the bottom to basically get the ships in. That will create a massive plume. And if that can be managed if they either dredge slowly or stop dredging. So, yes, that would have an impact, but, yes, that can be managed. The footprint itself, if they avoid seagrass areas, that is of less concern. There's other issues like how it may affect the circulation of the sound. That's one of my concerns. How it may impact on invasive species because there's this huge breakwater, break walls which they can colonise. And, yeah, just the, also the shipping operations may have longer ongoing impacts to water quality because they'll resuspend all the sediments as they move in and out. 